All right. We are at the top of the hour. Shall we get going? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Very good. good one. All right, Andy. Well, Let's shoot. I guess, as um, usual. Yeah. So welcome to Tech Talk Tuesday. Uh, I guess we're on really season three, Chris. And now that we're not doing a live every single week, it's about twice a month that we're doing live. And then the other two times a week, we're going to provide some other either pre-recorded content or something else of value. Uh, just because it's become hard to sort of post COVID dedicate every single Tuesday to going live. Uh, but if you're joining us for the first time, you can watch all of our other recorded episodes. They're all on YouTube under the baseline YouTube channel, which is baseline web training. And that's all one word baseline web training on YouTube. And it's also become a great place if you're looking um, to do something, to program something, to in install something, if you want to learn how something works or how to set something up, there is a lot of recorded content on the YouTube channel available. Uh, so you can learn on demand. And that tends to be a great way instead of waiting to wait in line for support or for support to call you back. There's information already out there. So you can just learn on demand. And today we are joined uh, by Chris Wright. He's the VP of sales for Baseline. Good day. And with uh, Ben Flanner. And Ben is the co-founder of Brooklyn Grange which is a, uh, hmm, how do I best describe this, Ben? A, a farm, a rooftop farm company. Uh, rooftop farm, event space, um, green roof designer and builder. Yeah. Yeah. So we, we have <laughs> talked about green roofs in the past, but we're going to take a little bit different spin today um, and kind of talk some, uh, of some interesting projects that are happening in New York City that have to do with sort of the farm to table aspect and, and producing those uh, crops in an urban environment, i.e. on rooftops. And so Definitely. Chris and I have both worked with Ben for, I think, about two years. I think, Ben, I, I met you originally right before COVID. Like, literally, there was the, in New York City, like, the same week I was there, and then all chaos broke loose, just to kind That's of right. That sounds about that right. Factor. Yeah. Yeah. I remember when you came up. It was the winner. Yeah. yeah. Um, but yeah, uh, so this do... episode also, it uh, kind of coincides with the visit that we had back there last September or mm -hmm. October, right, where we were able to see mm -hmm. the, the rooftop farm in Brooklyn and all of its uh, splendor and production. Um, and we had a pretty cool experience. So we wanted to share it with our our listenership, and then have it also coincide with a, a marketing message that we've been emphasizing through HydroPoint uh, for the last month or so about sustainability. And that continues to be a, you know, kind of a hot uh, talking point in the industry. And uh, this rooftop farming is definitely a, a trend that is expanding nationwide and globally for that matter. Um, and becoming more and more uh, mainstream and a lot more optics on it that, uh, you know, could impact the work that you do as a designer, uh, installer, or a maintainer of a like project uh, somewhere in your region of the country. Mm -hmm. Us other folks get to learn from all the mistakes we've made. That's right. Exactly. <laughs> Right. And <laughs> we know from uh, previous you know, discussions that we've done about green roofs in general and green walls, there definitely is a learning curve. And uh, if you want to uh, talk about microclimates and micro factors in landscape uh, installation and irrigation, you know, amplify that or compound it by tenfold at least once you get uh, on a roof or on a wall trying to do. Mm -hmm you know, similar things, right? Yeah. And it's actually been, that's a great comment learning from your mistakes, because whenever you're the first person to do something or one of the first, you have to make mistakes because the rules haven't really been written yet. You're figuring it out as you go along. And I think that it's really relatable for both mine and Chris's experience with baseline and probably some people listening, because over the course of 15 years, the things that we bring to market are sometimes new and they're different. And the, the kinks have to be kind of worked out along the way. So it's just, anyway, I can relate yeah. to that. Uh, learn from the mistakes for sure. Absolutely. Yeah, definitely. 
Okay, so um, let me share my screen for a minute and go through a couple of talking points and a couple of pictures that uh, kind of lay the foundation for our discussion today. Um, and please confirm for me once you can see my screen. Good. Do you see? Confirmed. Okay, but I'm on the wrong slide. It's okay. This is live, guys, obviously. You yeah, made sorry. Mistake. <laughs> Hold on. I don't know how that happened. But, uh, all right, let's try that again. Round two. Can you see that? Yep. All right. Slide. So let's define I... what sustainability is, right? Because it's a, a word that gets thrown around a lot um, in uh, the landscape industry. And I think there's a lot of disconnect as to what it means. It means much more than just water conservation. Um, it's really based on a simple pr uh, principle that everything that we need for our survival and well being depends either directly or indirectly on our natural environment. And this is a you know, definition from the EPA as to what sustainability is. And then as we work in the green industry, in, you know, maintaining, installing, maintaining, or designing landscapes and um, green infrastructure, uh, sustainability plays into the whole concept and principle of, of that practice. So with us uh, today in the main topic of discussion is this project that uh, we've been involved with for a uh, number of years and and Ben was very much involved in the installation and continued operation of it. It is the farm at the Javits Center right in downtown New York City, New York, right? And this is where that whole rooftop to table uh, concept comes from. And uh, as you can see in the picture, we are literally farming on a uh, rooftop above grade, right in the heart of the city. You've got the uh, Empire State Building in the, in the background, so you can see how close proximity it is. Um, so it's utilizing available acreage in the urban environment to produce food that can be locally used and consumed, uh, oftentimes right on site. Mm -hmm. Hey, Chris. Um, yep. So I, I, we know that um, Mike Astrom, uh, Northern Designs, assisted with the irrigation design, but uh, I just had this thought, and Ben, you might know, did, did you help design the actual farm layout up there? Yes. Yes. We, we were um, working on a consulting basis with the Javits Center for, for a couple of years, um, looking at, at the layout and how it would best suit, where to put the greenhouse, where to put the walkways, et cetera. Very cool. Then what, to, what exactly is the Javits Center? Um, well, the Javits Center is a, a huge convention hall, one of the largest in the entire country, and it's on the west side of Manhattan. And um, they expanded to the north a couple blocks, um, which was a, a multi-year construction project, I'm sure several other years in the planning. And... Um, were inspired by our projects and, and others that um, in, in the city with urban agriculture and green space. And they were inspired to create this um, green roof, which is about an acre of vegetables that we're looking at. And then also, um, and I believe we have one photo of it. There's a pavilion area um, uh, sort of like behind where this person would be standing um, and 38 fruit trees, like a, a small orchard of apples and pears and, and a whole bunch of um, beautiful perennial plantings. Very interesting. So we've got, uh, you know, vegetables and herbs that are growing, um, but you've also got fruit trees up there. What kind of yep. soil profile is there to support the growth of fruit trees? The fruit trees are in three and a half to four feet of, of soil. And, um, you know, we used a blend for that with a little bit lower organic matter, basically trying to emulate something um, approaching a sandy loam um, with a, a decent amount of drainage, maybe like a little bit more gravelly um, to make sure that there's no drainage issues or to, you know, create rots or funguses on the roots. 
Um, and, uh, you know, that type of tree actually doesn't want a ton of nutrient. Um, so we didn't really go overboard with, with the organic matter and, and stuff like that. And then um, on the top, we have a bed of clover and we're incorporating a lot more lower, lower perennials and even some berry bushes and like smaller fruiting plants um, in the space. Very cool. Yeah. And are, are the fruit trees, are they in like full canopy format or are they espaliered? Full canopy. Yep. Wow. We just pruned them actually last week and uh, gave them a, gave them a pretty good cut down. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, that's what generates fruit in the spring, right? Yep. Pruning them back. Well, I'm gonna Very go cool. Right. Yep. And then uh, on this photo, what we're looking at is um, uh, facing the opposite direction is, is a, about an acre of, of vegetables, which we just started at the end of last summer. So this season will be our first complete season up there. We'll be right in there as soon as the weather breaks. We also have about a 3000 square foot greenhouse there. Very cool. Yep. And are you growing in the greenhouse or is that as an event space? Yeah, we're growing in there. We um, actually on the, that white section at the end is our washing and packing room. So there's a, a walk-in cooler and sinks and hoses and stuff for, for cleaning the vegetables. And then in the glass section, um, there are, uh, there's a, a significant amount of bench space where we'll do all of our starts. So there'll be tens of thousands of plants started there that will then be transplanted out into the field. Um, we're also growing microgreens. Um, and then we have uh, a couple, uh, maybe about a thousand or a little more square feet with a double decker um, deep water culture hydroponic operation. Um, and there's, there's lights on the lower deck. Um, and uh, so we'll, we'll be doing some simple hydroponic crops there too. Not, not like massive fruiting crops. We don't have mm -hmm. quite the sun power or the infrastructure for that, at least now, but more like leafy greens, herbs, and things like that, that the kitchen can use through the winter. Yeah. yeah and summer. True. It's just that in the summer, it's a smaller percentage of what we grow because we have the whole outdoor season happening. Understood. Yeah. So some of the some of the intent and fun facts about uh, the operation. Obviously, we've got the uh, farm. Um, something that I thought was interesting was that it's using recycled rainwater for irrigation. How does that setup work? Um, that is actually a, a really exciting aspect of this project. We, we have. Um, we have three farms that we've been managing for over 10 years now, about 5.6 acres of vegetable space off of this location. But this location is the first time that we've had significant um, water catchment, these large cisterns that are actually in the basement of the building. Uh -huh. So those will capture a significant amount of the rainwater from all of the different drains that are on the roof from the green roof area and also some non-green roof areas that are, um, uh, you, you know, that obviously need drainage as well. And it holds it, sends it through a membrane filter and pumps it back up to us. So we'll be running um, some uh, biological samples to make sure the bacteria counts stay within a certain threshold that we need it for use on vegetables. And we'll actually use that um, reused water for our irrigation. And, and is that the is that the primary water source or is that a secondary water source? Is yes, it? that'll be the primary water source for the irrigation. We also have potable water for washing and packing and for the greenhouse for the microgreens. Um, we'll use chlorinated water for that uh, because the risk the risk thresholds a little bit higher. Um, but we'll we'll be excited to get some data. You know, every year is going to be different, but but the simple kind of back of the envelope calculations show that this should be about the total amount of water that we'll need. And there is of course a makeup. So if, if the tank runs dry, we can, we can use um, municipal water, but, but it'll, yep. it'll be really, really great to, to, to prove that, you know, this certain um, area, if we collect that water, plus some of the excess water from our irrigation, but that should be very small comparatively, um, if we send it back up that we, we can um, support all these vegetables and the perennials and the orchard, yeah. Very cool. And then we've got solar up there uh, to add to the sustainable uh, concept. Um, and then obviously we've got water conservation. And then also there's a lot of advantage for stormwater uh, diversion, correct? Yes. 
Yes, exactly. That's um. Well, that's that sounds like you did a green roof episode, but that's one of the most major tenets of the green roof industry. Um, that and and you know other ecosystem benefits as well as um, a cooling effect, which which can actually curb some of the urban heat island effect. But um, if not the most major, one of the most major um, benefits of green roofs is the stormwater management. The fact that it can both sponge water and hold it and also slow it down and reduce those, those peak drainage moments when we really have a lot of issues with combined sewage overflows and, and whatnot with, with our uh, sewage system. Absolutely. Yep. Yeah. So green roof plus cistern is kind of the, the, the Cadillac, you know, that's kind of like the, 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 a great place to be. It's just that it takes a lot more infrastructure to, to install those cisterns. So it's, it's not nearly as common, but, but we'll see as this project uh, evolves, hopefully it'll be an inspiration for, for some others to, to look into that when they do new construction. Absolutely. Yeah. And we mentioned, you know, at the beginning that this is a trend that's spreading nationwide and globally. Mm -hmm. And uh, Andy, it was uh, pretty random, right? That uh, you were able to uh, witness the, uh, uh, right. <laughs> you know, yeah. the, the media surrounding this type of a project at your home in, in Traverse City. You want to explain what? Yeah. What, well, uh, so Chris, is we're, we're about to show about a one minute, maybe less um, video. And what's weird is that I decided to watch the news one night. So that's what's really weird. Yeah. <laughs> You're too busy for the news. I mean, I just don't watch the news, right? You know, occasionally. So it's one of those occasions I sat down, turned on, you know, the news, which is this is the te television in my living room. And they said, coming up next, you know, roof to table, you know, in New York City, something like that. I'm like, all right, this, you know, I know of one of these projects. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, sure enough, you know, here comes, you know, your project, Ben, in New York City on my local news station in Traverse City. And I got out my iPhone and I recorded it. So the video that you're going to see is just taken from my iPhone. So the audio is, eh, it's okay. I think you can hear it. You might want to turn up your phone or computer, whatever you're listening here. Uh, this is just a good example of Ben's project getting, you know, national recognition on a small news station, you know, right here in Traverse City, Michigan. Awesome. All right. So let me see if I can get the thing to play. Here we go. The farm is part of a billion dollar expansion from the Javits Convention Center. 18 inches of soil collect and recycle rainwater, producing roughly 40,000 pounds of produce every year. Rooftop gardens like these could be the way of the future. We are increasingly alienated from our food systems. Rooftop farming is a way that we can really connect people directly with the food that they're eating. It is impressive. The rooftop garden also houses beehives that provide fresh honey for the convention center. Facebook. All right. <laughs> awesome. A clip to understand it. Yeah. yeah you could probably run uh, a Google search. If you couldn't hear it, I'm sure that that clip is just out there in the world. <laughs> yeah. I just, I think it's also a kind of a good moment for the, the group on this call too, being that they're, you know, kind of industry specialists and whatnot. Um, just in the last couple of weeks, we've had some, um, or we've been giving a little bit of assistance with, a, um, or, and hearing about more details about a project in Minneapolis and also one in the UK, um, just, just in the last couple of weeks. And, and I think you're right, there is, there's a lot of energy around not just the agriculture. I think the agriculture is is a super important component of it, but also um, utilizing our roofs in 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 better ways. So they're not just a you know a collection of tar that just has the water hit it and has the sun hit it, um, but there can be amenity spaces and ways to increase the the value and the usage of buildings and ways to get people outside enjoying them and and whatnot and growing food. And also a thing that that we are super um, on board with and also very enthusiastic with is um, uh, creating more ecosystem for for nature, for pollinators, more balance, um, restoring mm -hmm. some balance to the city and um, and what comes with that, you know, with different types of species and whatnot. Yeah, and we'll we'll talk to it in a moment, you know, yeah, about cool. the the further area of the green roof at, on Javits Center and how that is a 
a uh, migratory and breeding ground for you know different uh, um, bird species. Yes, the sedum green roof. Mm -hmm. Also, but um, you know as we as we look at the rooftop farming, that's one iteration of it for urban farming. But there's also a lot of you know in in warehouse growing that's going on as well with vertical farming also right under the indoor operations yep yeah indoor operations under you know simulated light conditions and mm -hmm. hydroponic conditions but the whole point is getting that food production closer to um you know the urban areas where yeah. the most consumption is and and not uh um relying on farmland that could be hundreds or thousands of miles away um to produce you know highly consumable uh food products that uh, we use on a daily basis yeah and, and i'll just uh interject here quickly we have uh dan fike who's an irrigation consultant in the wisconsin area and he just pinged in and i was familiar with this project it's called the old houston post office a green roof in houston seven acres and what i didn't know is he says two and a half acres are for a farm similar to this and he's you know the irrigation consultant designer on record for that. So I don't know if you know anyone there, Ben, but maybe there's a connection to be made. Cool. No, I want to meet him. Don't know about that one yet. It's very cool. All right. So some of the primary advantages of the baseline technology on this center or at the Javits Center and on this farm, um, you know, they're pretty common benefits, right? Um, as to uh, landscape irrigation as well, but uh, a few of them that you really highlighted, Ben, were, uh, you know, the two wire being that uh, we don't have a bunch of wires for the irrigation running around uh, on top of the building and, and through the beds that are obviously highly um, cultivated and rotated yeah. out, right? Exactly. Um, so you don't have to worry about uh, getting in the way of the irrigation infrastructure but i think the the ones that you utilize most are are data and then the cloud access and management why is cloud access and management essential on a green roof urban farm well with with the style of growing that we do on a on a rooftop farm you know we have at any given moment 30 40 50 even um, different types of crops growing. And, and many of them are also at different stages of their lives too. And we plant and we harvest every week, sometimes twice a week, even um, planting um, uh, in the peak season, we're harvesting almost every day. So the point is there's a huge amount of complexity and a huge amount of different stages of growth and different types of plants that require different amounts of water. Um, and I think we've kind of come at it a slightly different angle than a lot of other um, of our peers in farming have because um, largely because we inherited a green roof system um, that's very well drained. You know, traditionally a green roof media is going to have significantly higher porosity and, um, you know, higher propensity to drain, which means that's good for disease resistance and things like that, but also means that we have to really stay on top of our water. So through the years, um, that's been a prime focus of mine is to make sure that, you know, that everything's staying moist and, and basically having the theory of, you know, if, we, if you're dragging around a hose, that's, you shouldn't be doing that. <laughs> you know, you, you wanna have uh, your infrastructure set up so you can get every inch, um, however you need it. And then the next sort of step is all these zones. So we have lots of small zones. We have um, zones that are aerial. We have redundancy in place at this at any given point where there's drip tape available for you know for surface area or for um, you know for drip irrigation, and then also risers up um, for aerial. And sometimes it's just a matter of 24 hours where you need to toggle between one to the next. Like for example, after some seeds have germinated, um, you plant carrot seeds. You want to you need to make sure they stay moist. For like 10 days until they germinate but once they've germinated you can or soon after you can turn down the water and then eventually you really don't want that aerial water hitting them because that's going to lead to diseases um, too much standing water on the leaves um, yeah. of course the same with brassicas and all the salad mixes and lettuces that we grow too 
So long story short, just that access over the cloud that allows me to log in even remotely if I'm not on site that day, can check in with the managers, see how the different programs are going. Um, we can tweak it, obviously, at that moment, you know, real time mo in the moment um, as we need to. And then, and then over time, we're really looking forward to getting more and more information, you know, including like the soil, soil sensor data so we can really see different speeds we totally have microclimates so so that'll be you know su super relevant to our learnings um see how this soil reacts and the sort of like the curves on how it dries out and whatnot sure yep and then just the fact that you know it's not that readily easy to access the roof in order to you know get information directly from a controller that may be on site only right so having remote yeah. access to that information is is critical right and we have um we have four sites around brooklyn queens and manhattan right. um we also have a site in staten island that we're going to be starting to um maintain as well so it's it's physically impossible to be present and there all the time which just makes this um, you know, all the more appealing to us, especially going into the future to, to see um, how it can be scaled too. Very cool. All right. And before we move off of this slide, you know, for any Clash fans out there, if anybody can drop in the chat uh, what this picture reminds you of, uh, that'd be very cool as well. Clash fans. <laughs> One other thing I was just going to say is that the, um, the, the, the fellow who installed our irrigation um, and uh, did the original hookup on the on the baseline. At one point, I, I called him probably a month later, and he told me he was still logging in almost every day to take a look at it, which I was very I was cool. super impressed with. <laughs> I took that as a sign that you know, a that you can, and and b that that it's uh, you know that he cared a lot. Awesome. All right. So as we said, the the farm is part of the a larger green roof installation there at the Javits Center. And Andy, you've been involved in this project from the beginning as, you know, Baseline came in and retrofitted the controls up there. What's, uh, what can you add about that? Yeah, you know, and this is, let's see, we have two minutes left, maybe three. Mm -hmm. um, this was originally a, you know, let's throw irrigation on this new construction project at the last minute, which means the budget was basically, what can you get us for zero? Not baseline, but originally installed. And so it was just standalone controllers inside, you know, these um, uh, backflow enclosures. And in about 2018, I think, 2018, uh, we retrofitted all the existing standalone controllers over to baseline uh, systems and the, and the 3200, which ended up being a combination of 3,200 controllers and then wireless substations um, in order to link everything together because they had sort of more controllers than they had water sources. And it was kind of a, a complex retrofit that we were able to do with the wireless substation capability. And so myself, Chris, you know, we've been on this rooftop a number of times. And mm -hmm. when you go up there, you, other than looking at the skyscrapers, you forget that you're in Manhattan. And I would say the same thing's probably true, Ben, on, on the farm roof, is that it's like you've, you've gotten away. It's a totally different environment. It's really cool. Yeah, we hear that all the time. It's, it's a nice compliment when people come yeah, visit. Yeah, for sure. And then this green, green space serves as breeding ground for a bunch of different uh, goals that uh, are native to lower Manhattan, right? Yeah. So yeah, what we'll probably need to do is, um, so this is maintained by New York Green Roof, uh, New York Green Roofs, and this would actually be another great tech talk uh, to, to discuss this rooftop and what it's like to maintain it and manage it. Um, yeah, I was awesome. just going to say that they, they partner with the Audubon Society and, and maybe they could contribute as well. They've been doing a lot of cool studies that I don't know the details on them, but they've been studying. Yeah, all, the all I know is you don't want to be up there during uh, uh, breeding season because the goals are very, very protective they of are. their nests. It's crazy up there. You need to wear a hat, hard hat and carry an umbrella to uh, keep them off of you. It's true. So, uh, another project uh, in Brooklyn, this is, uh, you know, Brooklyn Grange. We visited this site also, but I wanted to emphasize, you know, from street level, looking at the building, you never know 
that on top of it is a full fledged farm operation, right? Yep. That's another one of our sites. That's right. So this is uh, kind of, uh, you know, going outside of a uh, convention center or a special uh, type of uh, meeting space or exposition. It, it's happening in real time on top of real commercial buildings, uh, just in normal neighborhoods. Yep. All right. So we're, we're out of time, essentially. And Andy, you know, we've been talking about uh, rooftop to table. Tell us the story behind this cocktail real quick. Well, the story starts that when Chris and I go to New York City, we like to, um, you might call it an urban adventure. Yes. <laughs> the urban jungle. You know, instead of doing some research, finding a restaurant, making a reservation and going there, the best where, where we find enjoyment is literally just exploring and, and then finding someplace like in that moment. And Chris and I took a little adventure over to um, Roosevelt Island, I think, Roosevelt Island. And we took the yep. tram over and it was right around sort of dinner cocktail time. And on the way there, we, we found this little, um, they call it a cafe, but it's more like a, it's a restaurant and it's kind of boutique and it's craft and they had oysters. So that was like our hook. We saw, oh, they have oysters. We got, right. We're going to go here. Yeah. We sat at the bar <laughs> and, you know, ordered a cocktail. This is what I received. I don't, well, that sounds bad. I do remember what it was. If I said I don't remember what it was, that would sound bad. <laughs> and it had this, um, you know, decorative garnish, if you will. Uh -huh. And, you know, we sort of said to the bartender, you know, oh, did this come from Brooklyn Grange? And he's like, yeah, totally. That totally came from Brooklyn Grange. And so in the real world, in, you know, just our explorer in New York City, we happened to order a drink that had um, you know, food from Ben's facility. So it's pretty awesome. Yeah. That's Thai basil. Yeah, Ben. Uh, it looks like, is the red, is the red on? Oh, the red's in the back of it. Yeah. Yeah. It's yeah. definitely Thai basil. Yeah. Yeah. Thai basil. Yep. So that was a good cocktail. I was getting sure. drawn by the red for a second. I was like, is that pineapple? Yeah. <laughs> or salvia or something, but no, no, it's definitely a Thai basil. Yeah. 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 And this particular restaurant advertised themselves as farm to table. So that's what they, you know, probably how they charge 40% more for everything that they offer. And they, it makes a boutique local and Craft. a different experience. Yeah, for sure. So kind of fun to, you know, be part of it and, and have it, uh, you know, in our wheelhouse as it relates to green roofs and, and this urban farming movement. And we're always uh, um, excited to, work with designers and consultants and providing them engineered solutions that have, you know, relevance in these types of projects and applications. So, all right, we are at, uh, we're beyond our time. We went a little long today. We appreciate everybody uh, sticking with us for a few extra minutes. And hopefully that was interesting information for you all. Um, if you would like to share this uh, episode with anybody, colleagues or associates that you think may be interested in it. Uh, it will be posted on baseline web training on the YouTube channel. And we will be back in a couple of weeks for another live session with Andy and myself. And, and then, hey Ben, uh, um, real quick, uh, mm -hmm. you know, we, what would be the, if somebody wants to ask you more questions or learn more or, or, you know, that sort of thing, what would be the best way for them to reach you? Um, I think by email, should, can I try to type that in? Or I can just say it too. It's Ben, my name, at brooklyngrangefarm.com. And um, you can find our web, it's the same as our URL. So if you find Brooklyn Grange's website, it's just Ben at. And, oh, and, and yeah, you got to totally. show your little hot sauce real quick. So oh, ben yeah, right. also, you know, they yeah. grow some peppers on the roof make and he sauce. makes his own hot sauce with it. And here's one of the bottles we make about just maybe 10, 10, 15,000 bottles a year, but it's, it's a fun thing to do with, with a lot of our peppers, peppers grow very well on roofs and, and it's something I like. We also make, yeah, so if you're watching bottle. today from Colorado and you like hot sauce, order some Brooklyn Grange hot sauce and then bring it out at your next barbecue or event. And you can share the story. There, there we go. go. Yeah. Awesome. All right, everybody. Thanks for joining us. Always right, a thanks pleasure. Thanks for having me. It was, it was great. Yeah, we appreciate you joining us, Ben. You're a great celebrity guest star. 
on Tech Talk Tuesday. And we failed to mention, Andy, that it's Tech Talk Tuesday on 2-22-22. A lot of twos. A lot of twos. So it's a lucky day. Everybody go out and uh, enjoy it. And uh, we'll see you next time on another live episode of Tech Talk Tuesday. Thanks, guys. See Adios. Bye.